For our next speaker, we have uh, Lee Kugelman, who is a genetic counselor here at the Fixell Institute at the University of Florida. She uh, recently joined us about a year ago at this point and has been a wonderful addition to our clinic. Um, she is available to see any and all patients and families, uh, not only with Huntington's, but with any potentially genetic disorders. So she's been a, a really wonderful resource at understanding you know, how your Huntington's may be affecting um, your, your family. And so we're happy to have her and excited to hear from her. Great. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Let me get my slides up. So I'm going to talk today a bit about um, genetic testing for Huntington's disease. Um, there are no conflicts of interest. So I'm going to go over, um, just so we're all on the same page, some backgrounds into the genetics of HD. I'm going to talk about the testing process as well as some things that are important to consider if you're going through that testing process. Then I'm going to highlight just a couple um, complex situations that sometimes get brought up in clinic. So for um, some basic biology background, a gene over here, this is a section of our DNA that has a specific job. And our DNA is this long strand. It gets wound up. Oh, I didn't mean to go forward like that. It gets wound up into these structures called chromosomes. Um, and our chromosomes exist inside every cell in our body. This is my cartoon version. But if we were look, to look at your chromosomes under a microscope, this is what they actually look like. Um, and you can see that they come in pairs here. And that's because we get one from our mom and one from our dad. So for each gene, which is at a spot, one spot on each of these chromosomes, we have two copies. The Huntington's gene, it's called HTT. It's located over here at the end of chromosome number four. So the function of our genes, I like to think of them like a recipe, only instead of making a cake, our bodies are trying to make our, a protein. So just like you've got the instruction manual from your recipe where you put in the flour, the egg, the sugar, everything else that you wanna make for your cake, our bodies have an instructions too. This comes in the series of these coded letters here. Um, and this I'm using as an example, let's say these are the HTT genes. This dark copy can be from one parent and the light copy can be from another parent. So we've got two genes and each of these genes is made up of this whole genetic code. If there's some sort of change in a gene, so you know your recipe tells you to add too many eggs, for example, you're not gonna be able to make the cake that you were trying to set out to make. And that's exactly how our genetic code works. If there's some sort of change, you might also hear this called a mutation or a variant, or in Huntington's, we talk about a repeat. The body's not able to read that code and it's not able to make the protein that it's trying to make with that gene. So in this presentation, I'm gonna represent a gene change with this red marker here on one copy of the gene. Now you might be familiar that in Huntington's, the specific gene change that we're concerned about is what, what's called a repeat. So at one point in our Huntington gene, there are these letters C, A, G, and sometimes they can get repeated over and over and over again. And that's what we see here. C, A, G, C, A, G, C, A, G, over and over and over again. This is a common mechanism in, in some of the neurological diseases we see here. And repeats are actually not uncommon across our whole, um, our whole genome, but um, in many diseases, if the number of repeats is over a certain threshold, that's when they can start to have a harmful effect and we can start to see the symptoms of a certain disease. So when we do genetic testing for Huntington's, what the lab is looking at is they're trying to get an idea of how many of these repeats are here. And when we know that number, we can then interpret and uh, see if this can explain someone's symptoms. One thing to know about this repeat number is we, we say that they're unstable. So what that means is as the Huntington gene gets passed down the family from generation to generation, the repeat number can change and it can expand. Their in, the number of repeats can increase. This is more likely to happen when it's passed from a father to their children than when it's coming from a mother. So what that means is that a father is uh, more likely to have a lower repeat number than their children. Their children could have a, a higher number. So when we look at this repeat number, 
um, we have to consider where does this fall on the spectrum of, you know, could you have Huntington's or not? So we know that repeats between nine and 26 are what we call the normal range. If someone has repeats in this number, there's no risk for developing Huntington's. Repeats greater than 40, we call that the full penetrance range. We know someone with 40 CAG repeats will at some point in their lives develop Huntington's disease. In the middle, it can get a little tricky. This yellow range here is what we call the intermediate zone. Um, it's not traditionally thought to be a, a number that can cause Huntington's, but there are some case reports in the literature um, that are you know, up for discussion about this patient has symptoms that look like Huntington's. What do we think of this? Are we sure? Then this um, higher range here between 36 and 39, we call that the reduced penetrance. Um, we know some individuals with repeats in this range can have Huntington's, um, but not all, everyone in that range. Another thing about these, these blue and yellow ranges here is that even though they won't for certain cause symptoms of Huntington's, they're still at risk for expanding. So for example, if someone has 37 repeats, they may not develop Huntington's, but the, one of their children could have 40 or more repeats, and then they would certainly at some point develop Huntington's disease. So we know a few things about this repeat number. One thing we know is that it roughly correlates with the age of onset for symptoms. So what that means is that the um, higher your repeat number, the younger a person, uh, younger you are when your symptoms can start. But it's, it's not exact. I can't say, okay, this person's repeat number is 41. And so that means they will have symptoms at this age. We don't know for sure. We just know that as that repeat number gets to get higher, the trend says the age of onset goes down. Other things that we can't tell by the repeat number are what symptoms someone is going to present with, when they're going to present with them, or how those symptoms are going to change as a person's disease progresses. All we can say is, um, is this person at risk for Huntington's or not? So when we talk about how HD is inherited, it's inherited in what we call an autosomal dominant manner. So what that means is you, in your two copies of the gene here, one copy will have this HD repeat, that's right here. And then this light blue copy here, this is a copy with a normal number of repeats. So this, this image here, this is a parent with Huntington's disease. When they go on to have their kids, they at random pass down one copy of each one of their genes. So that means it's like flipping a coin. They could pass down either the copy with the repeats or the copy with the normal number of repeats. So, you know, if they pass down this dark blue copy here with the expanded number of repeats, these children would at some point develop Huntington's disease. But if they pass down this blue copy, this light blue copy, these children over here will not develop Huntington's disease. So we say if someone has Huntington's, there's a 50% chance that they could have a child who could have Huntington's at some point in their lives. Now, this risk is independent for each one of each one of this person's children. So just because their first child had the um, expanded repeats doesn't mean the next child um, will not. Like I said, it's like flipping a coin. So you could flip a coin over and over and land on heads every time. It, everyone is independent. So the only way to know for sure if uh, someone inherited an expanded copy of the um, Huntington gene, so if someone has one of these uh, disease-causing repeat chain uh, copies, is to do genetic testing. We tend to categorize, there's two types of genetic testing um, that we see here in the clinic. Confirmatory testing is for when someone presents to us, they've been having symptoms and we're suspicious they might have Huntington's. So maybe they've had changes to their walk or changes to their speech or their behavior. And confirmatory testing can be ordered in order to see, is this due to Huntington's or to rule it out and see maybe there's other causes for someone having these symptoms. For someone who has a family history of Huntington's but doesn't yet have symptoms, we uh, can consider what we call predictive testing. 
So that can tell you um, if you've inherited that expanded repeat co gene copy from a parent or another, you know, whoever else in the family is, uh, has Huntington's, and um, if you are at risk of developing symptoms in the future. Um, genetic testing for Huntington's is, is complex and it can, it can affect a lot of people in the family. It can affect, um, you know, involve a lot of emotions. So um, it's important to remember that genetic testing is a decision. It's a conversation between um, a patient and a provider. And um, it really requires, it requires informed consent and it really is your decision. So I want to talk about the HDSA has developed a testing protocol for us to do, use when we um, talk to someone about doing genetic testing. Um, this was developed in collaboration with uh, members of the community and uh, members of the HDSA community, as well as clinicians who um, are managing people, patients with Huntington's disease um, in order to make sure that we are uh, protecting patients' autonomy and protecting their rights as well as providing you know, the best level of care that we can. So step one is usually an initial phone call. Someone will reach out to us and say, you know, I am interested in getting Huntington's genetic testing. At that point, I, I talk about the testing process um, and get ready for our visit. What, what do you need to know in order to have our visit? The first visit um, in our clinic involves genetic counseling. We educate the um, patient about um, Huntington's genetic testing and the disease, and they're also um, evaluated by our neurologist. Then if testing is ordered at that first visit, um, uh, the follow-up visit would be when those results are back and it's time to disclose those results. And then the last step in the protocol is this follow-up phone call. So I check in usually about four weeks after someone's uh, gotten their results just to see how have you been doing with these results? Um, have any, has anything changed for you? Have you talked to you know, friends and family about the results? I just wanna see how you've been coping with this news. The important thing to remember is the time between you know, going to this first visit does not mean that you will proceed with genetic testing. The end of, so a lot of people come to this visit just to get the information, to get checked in with our team, and to learn more, and they may not decide to go through with testing soon or ever after this first visit. Um, but it is very a very helpful way to get all of your information and all of your ducks in the row at the first step. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what my job is as a genetic counselor in our clinic. Um, you know, my, my job is not to be a gatekeeper to people getting genetic testing. I want everyone who wants genetic testing to go ahead and um, get that test done. Um, my job is really to provide education and provide support for people going through that process. So I want to make sure the people I'm talking to have a good understanding of what their risk is and what getting testing will mean for them and other members of the family. Talking to a genetic counselor can help some people explore your thoughts. You know, having that conversation helps you work through things, work out your feelings about getting this test and, you know, have a better understanding of what's, what's your motivation in getting this test done. It can also sometimes be helpful to talk to a third party who knows, um, uh, you know, knows about Huntington's but isn't directly a member of your family. You know, sometimes it can be difficult to have these conversations with your siblings or parents or other members of your friends and family who are personally directly affected by this disease. And it can be helpful to talk to someone who's familiar with it, but doesn't necessarily have um, that uh, connection to you and your family. Um, other things that I can help support with is, you know, how, how do we communicate this information within the family? Um, how do we tell siblings or children about test results or about their risk? Um, so that's something that I can support with as well for our patients. So this initial visit, um, we, we ask that these are done face-to-face. -face. Um, it's important for us to be able to sit down and you know, communi communicate directly with each other. We also ask that patients who are coming to this visit um, bring someone who can provide support. It's not mandatory, um, but it can be helpful. You get a lot of information at this first visit and it can be helpful to have an extra set of ears and um, someone who's gonna see you there through the testing process if you decide to go through with it. 
Um, this person can be a, a spouse or a friend. It can be a family member. But I, I caution people who, you know, think about bringing a sibling or a, a parent who has Huntington's because those are people who have an emotional stake in the situation. And sometimes you need someone who's going to be focusing on your emotions and your needs and um, don't want them to be, you know, caught up in their own emotions about whatever your test results might be. So during this first visit, our patients meet with me. I talk to you about what are your motivations for testing? What have you considered, you know, in the time leading up to this? What brings you in today? I want to get your family history. I draw out what, what we call a pedigree or a family tree to learn about the history of Huntington's disease or, you know, other similar neurological symptoms in your family. Um, and then I also check in and make sure you fully understand everything about genetics of Huntington's, uh, how it's inherited, what your risk is, and things like that. After, after seeing me uh, at our clinic, um, our patients are evaluated by a neurologist. Now, this doesn't happen at every HDSA clinic. Uh, every center of excellence doesn't require that you see a neurologist at this visit. Um, for us, it's helpful. Um, it can be helpful for some of our patients who are might be concerned they're having symptoms um, to ha actually have a, a doctor look at them and um, evaluate, are these symptoms or are they not? Um, if at the end of this visit, a patient decides to, that they are going to proceed with testing, we sign the consent form, um, answer any last questions, and then we can place the order for the test. Then during the results disclosure visit, this also, um, we like to do face-to-face. -face. Um, in these days lately, we've been doing results visit disclosures over Zoom um, because, you know, uh, due to COVID, it's been difficult to get everyone back in clinic, but it is important for us to be able to see each other so that way I can watch and see how are you reacting to this information. Um, again, at this visit, I, I recommend that people get those results in the company of someone who can provide support with them. These visits are always scheduled in advance. I don't ever call someone and surprise them with some gen genetic test results. I want to make sure uh, my patients are prepared and in a comfortable space where they can fully attend to whatever information I'm about to give them. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about predictive testing. So again, that's testing for people who don't have symptoms yet, but are at risk of having symptoms of Huntington's due to their family history. Predictive testing is a really individual decision. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And I think the reason to get predictive testing, there, there are as many reasons to get predictive testing as there are people who are considering them. So from the people that I've spoken with, I've just got some examples here of common reasons people choose to proceed or not proceed with predictive testing. Um, some people who choose to go ahead, they, they come into my office uh, surrounding a major life event. So they've just graduated, started a new job, they've got married, um, someone new in their family has been diagnosed with Huntington's. There's something big that's motivating them to come and say, okay, now's the time that I want to explore this. Other people are here because they want to inform other family members. So for example, they say, well, my, my kids are adults now, and if I get tested, I can advise them on, you know, if they are going to need to get tested or not. What is their risk? Um, some people come to see us because they have concern that they've been experiencing symptoms and they're not sure. They need to be, you know, they'd like to be evaluated and they'd like to get tested to see are these really symptoms or not. Other people come in because they've been weighing the, the anxiety. It's a, it's a bit of calculus that they have to do. You know, is the anxiety of getting this information can be high, but so can, sometimes so can the anxiety of not knowing for sure. The uncertainty can really weigh on people. People have to make that decision. So if people decide that the anxiety of uh, the uncertainty is worse than the anxiety of whatever the result is going to be, then getting predictive testing can be really helpful and relieve that anxiety. Other people, when they choose not to get predictive testing, um, and this is actually for people in this position at risk for Huntington's, this is the majority of cases. 
um, there's been studies that have shown only about 10 to 15 percent of people um, who are at risk for HD actually proceed with getting predictive testing. So if you're in this in this position where you know you're you're not sure which which way you want to go, um, there are people in both camps. Uh, so some of the things that people consider when they're uh, not you know not interested in getting predictive testing is they say, well, you know. I can't change it. We had a great talk just a little bit ago about the um, uh, disease modifying therapies on the horizon. Um, but you know, in past years and even some still today, since there's currently not a disease modifying therapy that's available and approved, um, people feel like, well, if it's gonna come, it's gonna come and I can't make any changes right now. So I'll just wait and see. Other people are afraid about um, discrimination by insurance or their employers. Um, and I've got a slide on that to cover in a little bit. Um, sometimes people say, you know, whether I know this result or not, it's not going to change any decisions I'm going to make about my job or my family. So there's not really a need to know. I'm going to live my life the same way, no matter what the result is going to be. And then for some people, when they do that mental calculus of is the worry is the uncertainty more greater than uh, what the result could be? It's not, they're not bothered by the uncertainty. Um, and so they don't proceed with testing. Um, like I said, there are so many individual reasons and uh, every whatever decision you make is the right decision for you. My job can sometimes involve helping people sort through their thoughts about this and helping them try to figure out what is the decision for me? So some of the things that I ask people when they're trying to decide this are, you know, how would you feel if it was positive? How would you feel if your test came back negative? Think about that. Put yourself in, in each of those shoes and um, try to see how does that make you feel? Another question I like to ask is, who are you going to tell this information to? Who in your life do you want to share this with? Also, you know, what will this result change? Is this result going to impact decisions about your career, decisions about your family planning or things like that? They're all, these are all important topics to really work through um, before you decide to proceed with testing. So now I wanted to check on, talk on just some um, you know, complex situations regarding testing for Huntington's. Um, so this is a situation where uh, a patient could come in and see me. She has a grandfather with Huntington's, but her mother hasn't had testing yet. She doesn't know it, her gene status and she doesn't have symptoms yet. So right now we know the grandfather has Huntington's. The mother has a 50% chance and this daughter here has a 25% chance. So if the daughter, this young woman gets genetic testing and her result is positive, we will know that the mom's result has to be positive for her to have inherited it. So in her getting testing, she would could possibly reveal her mother's result. And so, you know, this can be a concern. Is this, is this appropriate? Um, the, the short answer is, if you're in this position, you can still proceed with testing, but we want to have a conversation about a couple things. Has this woman talked to her mom about getting testing? How does she feel? Are they on the same page about everything? Um, does she plan on telling her mom these results? Does her mom understand everything? Sometimes I might ask, you know, has your mom had genetic counseling before? And it might be helpful for your mom to come in and talk to me, um, make sure that she understands and has made a decision on her own about this. Um, but again, our job is not to gatekeep genetic testing from anybody, but it's just to support people who are going through the process, make sure everything has been considered. Um, another issue that can come up is testing of minors, so testing children. Um, per the HTSA policy and, you know, our clinic here at UF, um, testing children is not recommended unless the child is showing symptoms. So if there is a concern for juvenile Huntington's, it's important for that child to be evaluated by a neurologist. Um, things like behavior changes um, could be caused by something else, and they, it's important for them to be looked at thoroughly. Um, things to consider if, you know, if testing, you know, when considering testing a child for Huntington's is 
what, what would a parent do with this information? Is this information that's going to affect the child's medical care? Um, is this information that the parent wants to keep from their child? Or do they want to share their child, share with their child? And if so, when and how? Um, is this going to change how the parent treats their child, knowing that they're positive? Is keeping that information from their child going to be difficult, make the parent feel really anxious? So um, this is a really difficult subject, and this is why the HDSA has that policy that uh, unless the child is showing symptoms, we don't test minors for Huntington's disease. And then the last situation I wanted to bring up is anonymous testing. So this would be where a, a sample is su submitted uh, for genetic testing and it's submitted under a fake name. It doesn't have your name or your Im information on it. Um, this is not an option at all uh, centers. We are working on um, getting making this an option here at UF. Um, this has involved a lot of discussions with um, various, various groups at UF. Um, but this is something that it could be considered for people who are concerned about discrimination by insurance companies or employers or other parties um, who don't want their name attached to a result. Um, the important thing to know if um, anonymous testing is available to you and it's something that you're considering is that in the future, it, it may need to be repeated. So for example, if you, your test result is positive and um, you, you develop symptoms, you need to come in for medical care. In order for that care to be covered by your health insurance, um, we may need to uh, repeat this test to confirm that you do have Huntington's and it's associated with your name. So then just to touch on that um, insurance and discrimination issue, there's two laws at play um, regarding this. One is a federal level law this is called the GENA, it's the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. This has been around since 2008. And this applies to health insurance companies and employers. So what this law says is that health insurance companies cannot request uh, or requ request the results of genetic testing or require that you have genetic testing done. And employers cannot make employment decisions based on the genetic test result with the caveat that that only applies to employers of uh, 15 or more people. So if your company is smaller than that, GINA does not apply. Um, so what this law says is that, um, you know, this law truly just applies to the results of a genetic test. So for example, if someone has symptoms of Huntington's, um, the health insurance company can use the medical care to make decisions about their coverage but it cannot use the results of someone's genetic test to make decisions about denying coverage or what level of coverage or premium rates or things like that. In Florida, as of last summer, we have a new law that is supposed to cover life, disability, and long-term care insurance. Um, it says these insurer companies cannot cancel uh, or deny you coverage based on the results of genetic information they can't change your rates. They can't request that genetic information. So uh, this is, again, just, just went into action last summer. What I've been telling my patients is that uh, Gina has been around for a very long time now. There's been a number of lawsuits um, where we've seen how the courts will interpret Gina. And I know it's a strong law and will be upheld. This Florida law, I'm not aware of any lawsuits that have happened since it's, uh, since it's been enacted. So I can't say for certain how a court is going to interpret this law. We'll have to keep an eye out and see, um, see how strong this law ends up being. So my last slide here, I just wanna give you a couple of resources, places to learn more. If you're looking for a genetic counselor in your area, you can go to findageneticcounselor.com. Um, as well as on the HDSA website, um, if you look at their centers of excellence, they will list if they have a genetic counselor. HDSA also has a really wonderful resource here at this link. Called, it's a page called Genetic Testing in Your Rights. It has a lot of information. It's got a family guide. It's a PDF that you can download. Um, and then it as well has um, a huge question and answer section really laying out the details of GINA, that uh, insurance discrimination law, um, with some examples as well. So um, if you have questions about that, this is a great place to look for some resources. Okay, so that is all that I have. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them.
That was great. Thanks, Leah. I think we do have one. Yeah, I see someone in the result. Let me hit answer live and hopefully people can see it. So the first part is, do you offer telecounseling versus in-person visits for testing? So um, yes, we are offering telecounseling here at UF. Um, in uh, the um, Dr. McFarland or uh, Dr. Patterson is also able to do telemedicine visits. Um, they can they can comment if there are some limitations on that for our um, initial Huntington's visit. But myself, I'm happy to do telecounseling. I do like to do those over Zoom though, just because I think it's it's easier on the conversation if we can see each other face to face. And then the next part of that question, um, I've heard you can also provide saliva versus blood for the actual test. Um, so the um, a, DNA tests can be done truly with any any type of sample, and saliva samples are um, are commonly accepted for a lot of different tests. Um, the exact sample requirement is really going to depend on what the lab is. Um, the the DNA you can get from a saliva sample is just as good as from a blood sample, but sometimes it's hard to get enough DNA. So sometimes um, labs for a test like uh, HD, which is a sensitive test and it um, requires a lot of DNA to do the test, they will recommend a blood draw. So the, the important thing there is just to see, you know, what, uh, what lab the test is being ordered from and what their specimen requirements are. Um, the, the cost, if, if uh, this isn't ordered through insurance, again, is going to vary based on the lab. Um, each of them will set their own prices. So, uh, I, I can't quite answer that one. And then regarding anonymously, so um, I touched on that a little bit. Uh, uh, anonymous testing is available at some centers and um, you can absolutely pay cash if, um, if that's something that you're able to do. Uh, Leah, maybe I can, I think we can save some questions for later, but I will just mention to folks, we, we do have a program here at the University of Florida through our Huntington's Disease Society of America. Um, for those patients who really do not, are not able to afford or don't have insurance. Um, and we are certainly happy to discuss with you if there are any you know, concerns for privacy um, and can work with you um, to help with costs if necessary for testing. If, really strongly desired and it makes a lot of sense. So please just discuss with us. So yeah, yeah. thanks so much, wow. Oh, here. Let's see, I'll answer one more question really quick. Does the patient pick the lab or do you? So here at UF, we have ordered our tests through Quest um, and that's just, that's been our, our standard workflow. We have an agreement with Quest. Um, it, it may vary from institution to institution. 